Well, we are in 2 Corinthians, uh, we chapter 5 today. And just a little quick background, Paul is um, logically moving us along through this point of, uh, through his point of teaching us that all of his troubles and all his hardships are a regular thing for him as an apostle because he proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ, because he is actively speaking the gospel. He is working in the ministry of the Lord, the ministry of the Spirit. And even though God has allowed this suffering in our lives and in his life, but it extends to us too, uh, even God is using these sufferings and using these hardships and using all of these difficulties to um, sustain us and to refresh us and to keep us going. These are happening so God can work in us and we would make a, a, an impact in the lives of everyone else. And because Because that's true, we don't get discouraged. We're not discouraged by this gospel ministry. We do not lose heart because we we know that God is using us and growing us and working in us through this gospel ministry. And even more so, God has promised us, which is where we are in the last couple of weeks, God has promised us last week, we studied this, he's going to give us a new heavenly body. And when this body is over, when the life we live in now, when this body ceases and we die and we don't live anymore when this body is dismantled by death we will have a new body we will have a heavenly dwelling that's what God's word says that's what he promises us and that because of that we don't lose heart and since that's true even though here and now we struggle we struggle with the here and now we really do because we know we have something better coming for us, we have, we have a new heavenly dwelling coming for us who believe in Jesus Christ, it's going to be so good that what we have now just sort of seems a bummer. We're always struggling with it. We don't like it. We long for this new body. We groan with heavy sighs about um, the life we have now, the world we live in now, our own sin, uh, our own suffering, our own misery, all the things we're dealing with now makes us groan. Because we know something better is coming, a new body, a, a, a body that's going to be like Christ. And as long as we are in this body, as long as we are stuck here in the here and now, we groan. We're, Paul says we'd be found naked. We don't want to be found naked. When, when you're found naked, that means you're ashamed. You don't want to be walking around the mall naked. We struggle with this. So we want the new body, we long for the new body that will be like Christ. We know it's coming because God has given us his Holy Spirit as a guarantee, promising that it's going to happen. This thing is eternally secure. He has secured this for us by the Spirit. So that's where we are so far. Let me read what we're going to study tonight, today, and then uh, I should be able to get through all of it. We'll see. Uh, chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. He says, Therefore... We are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we, as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, it's exciting to think about uh, getting a new heavenly dwelling, a new play, a new building from God. It's eternal. That's very exciting. And that makes us susceptible to only thinking about things like that. This text is a good reality check for us. It's important that we stay focused on the work that we have to do here and now. Because there's an old saying, I remember, I don't know how many times I heard it and how many... people I've heard it from, but uh, we long for this new body, but we do not want to get so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. That's in this text. That's what we're looking at today. Our present experience does matter. What we do here and now on earth, what we do here and now in this life, in this body affects what happens in our heavenly future. So Paul says in verse verse 6, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Therefore, because of everything God has revealed to us by his spirit, in, with his spirit, giving us security and confidence 
security and assurance of our new and better heavenly dwelling, because that's true, given to us by the Spirit, we are always confident. The word uh, means uh, confidence. It's translated six times, used six times in the Bible. Uh, five of them are in 2 Corinthians. And it's used, it says it's translated confident in the NIV every time except two times it says bold. And it's used one time in Hebrews too. But it means to have an attitude of confidence or firmness of purpose. We're convinced about something. We are convinced, and some translations say we have good courage, but it basically means we're convinced. We're confident of this truth. We know we're firmly convinced about this always, all the time. We always know something because God has given us his spirit. We know something about our future, about the future that we have, that this is it. As long as we are here, as long as we are physically alive in this mortal body, as long as we are at home in this earth, as long as we're living here in this temporary tent, this body, until the day comes when we finally die, until then we are away from the Lord. Until then, uh, I think the old, ver uh, some of the versions say absent from the Lord, absent from being home with him. Now I do want to say this, this does not mean that we don't have experience with the Lord or we're not enjoying his presence. We are in Christ, the scriptures say. We belong to him and are united with him by his spirit. So spiritually, we're always with him. Spiritually, we are always in him. He is in us, we are in him. So Christ is not absent from us and we're not absent from Christ. He is our life. Even now, in this life, Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 20, I am always, I, will, I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Paul said in Galatians 2 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So I don't want to get confused or get anyone confused or I don't want to be confused. Y'all know how confused I get. I don't want to be confused that Christ is not with me now. To be here in this body means I'm absent with the Lord, but that doesn't mean that he is absent from me. He has not left me. He has not left any of us who belong to him. What Paul means, though, is that we, to be absent from Christ, to be away from the Lord, means to be, uh, we just do not experience him visibly. We cannot see him here and now. So in that sense, we are separated from him. There's a disconnect with our eyes, we don't see him. In this life, we don't have Jesus now with us in this body. We don't see Jesus. We don't see him. We're distant from him. We're away from him. We're not with him. Now, he is in us, and we are in him, but he is not with us physically. We don't see him. That's what Paul means here. And because of that, the life that we have now with Jesus, this is true, this is true, doesn't sound very spiritual. Doesn't sound like something a pastor would say. But our life with Christ now is less intimate, less loving, less enjoyable, less... It's just not as good as it will be when we see him. What I have now is good. I have Christ in me, I am in him, but it's not as good as it will be when I see him and I'm away from him. The line of sight presence will bring with it joy that I do not have now. When I look at him in his face and can see him, I will experience joy that I do not have now. It'll be better than it is now. And right now we don't have that. We don't have it yet. And even when we do die, we'll still not have our glorified body yet. Everything we've been talking about, the heavenly dwelling, even when you die, you won't get that yet. You get that when he comes back. At the resurrection, we get glorified bodies. At the resurrection, we get a body that's like his body. We, at the resurrection, we're, um, it's gonna be great. That happens when he comes. So all of this groaning, all of this pressure, all of this stress that we have here and now, it's groaning, isn't it? It's stress, it's pressure. That's not, not really a, a problem. That's not a dilemma. That's not a conundrum. That's not something to throw us back. It does make us groan. We are indeed stressed out. We are indeed 
pressure, pressured by it, but it's not a problem. And here's why. Paul says in verse 7, we live by faith, not by sight. Yeah, we're absent, with Christ, we're absent from Christ now. We're in this body, we're in this tent, we're absent with Christ. That's not a problem. We live by faith, not by sight. Now, this is pretty cool because this is the verse which I chose when we decided to do 2 Corinthians. It was on, the, it's on the, all the slides, all the, not all the slides, but the opening slide. 2 Corinthians, we live by faith, not by sight. That's the verse that I chose to use as the subtitle for the theme of the whole book, as if it were the theme of the whole book. The problem with that is there are so many things for this book that if I chose any one of them, I'd run out of titles. But this is it. We live by faith, not by sight. And it goes back to what we studied last week, verse 18, or two weeks ago. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We don't see it. We don't see it now. We don't. So we have to look at with spiritual eyes and focus on things that are eternal. And those are the things that we live by faith with. Paul said, uh, I read the first part of this, chapter Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then he says, the life I live in the body, here and now, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we live by faith. In the Greek, it's literally, it's the word walk. We walk by faith. But when you say walk by faith, uh, in another language, it's an, an idiom. It's an expression that means to behave, to conduct yourself, to live like something. So when it says we walk by faith, he basically means we live by faith. We live like this. This is the way we behave. This is the way we live. We live by faith. So if we live by faith, it's no big deal. It is stressful. It is pressure. It is anxiety producing. I'm talking about me. Anxiety is there, but it's no big deal to not see Christ yet. We cannot see him yet. It's not a big deal that we are not with him yet. It's not a big deal because faith overcomes doubt. It's not a big deal because faith vanquishes and does away with doubt. Faith overrides doubt. That's what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We don't see it. We don't see it, but we believe it. We don't see it, but we know it. And we're not talking about wishful thinking and we're not talking about some vague type of I hope so faith. This is real stuff. We believe whatever God says in his word about anything that he says. We believe anything that God says in his word about himself. We believe anything that God says in his word about his son. We believe anything that whatever God says in his word about his salvation in his son. We believe what God says about his will and his commands for us. We believe those things. In anything. Take us a month of Sundays just to go through some of them. Whatever God says in his word, we believe. That's faith, living by faith, not by sight. And here in this text, we believe whatever God has revealed about himself and his promise to clothe us in a new heavenly building, a new body. We believe that God is going to give us a new body. I don't see it now. I don't have it now. I don't see Christ's face now. I don't, I'm not there with him now. It's, I'm absent from him. I'm away from him. I'm not there now, but I will see him. It's going to happen. I live by faith. I believe that. Even though you can't see it now. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There are days, there are probably way too many days, I say it with my shame, I, way too many days when I just don't know if it's even really going to happen or not. Or is that just me? Like, it's just a bummer day. When's, when am I going to get to see Christ? I doubt it. There are days like that, true. I mean, I'm, I'm saying that's true with me anyway. But still, we believe it because we live by faith. We live by faith, not what we can see with our eyes. We live by looking at the eternal 
We live by looking at the spiritual. We are going to see Christ's face. We will be with him. We will not be absent from him. We will not be away from him. We will be with him. That's going to happen when this body is gone, when this body decays, and when this body is dismantled and we die, we will be with him. And you know, this is kind of always a difficult thing. In fact, this is the number one thing, living by faith. This is perhaps the most challenging part of the Christian life. Not to struggle with what Jesus said to his disciples many times, you of little faith. Jesus said to his disciples, you of little faith. And it was simple things like this. Uh, Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear. God feeds the birds. God clothes the flowers. Why are you anxious about that? Why are you worried about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear? God feeds those things. He takes care of them. Do you think he's not going to take care of you? Why do you worry about that? You of little faith. Or why do you uh, panic and fear and I mean, high, major, major, high level stress out when an urgent issue comes up or an emergency happens. They're in the boat. Jesus is asleep. Storm comes up. And they all, and these are fishermen. These are masters of the sea. Waking him up saying, don't you care if we drown? He says, you have little faith. Don't you know that if Jesus is in the boat, you're going to be safe? No, apparently not. Living by faith is not an easy thing. Or uh, um, you doubt God's goodness, you doubt God's strength when he commands you something. Uh, Jesus is walking on the water, they're all afraid. Peter says, hey, if it's you, let me come out there. And Jesus says, well, come on. Peter starts walking out there and then he looks around and sees the wind and the waves and what's he start doing? He's sinking and he says, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and saved me. He says, why did you doubt you of little faith? Just living by faith in what Jesus commands. Anybody struggle with that? I bet you do. Or when you just don't understand something Jesus says. You just don't have the wisdom to discern it and figure it out. Jesus said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And they thought he meant bread. Not only did I have, he says, don't you understand? I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about the teaching of the Pharisees. You of little faith. Not only do they have little faith, they're not too bright. Faith, living by faith. Or how about when you don't cope well when you're under some kind of spiritual oppression and demonic attack? You know, Jesus came down from the Mount of Figuration and the disciples were down there. They couldn't cast out a demon. So Jesus cast out the demon and he sort of rolls his eyes and huffs and goes, oh, you have little faith. You have little faith. Uh, well, the Son of Man, when he comes to find faith on the earth, apparently not much. You couldn't cast it out. You have little faith. And for stuff like that, you know, Paul writes to the Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, take up the shield of faith of which you can extinguish, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So yeah, we live, in, we live by faith, not by sight. That's the text. And it's true, but this is not easy. This is not an easy thing, living by faith. Just believing what God says, and even though I can't see it, And I I almost can't see it to the point where I I have a difficult time even imagining it. And God says, believe me, that day is coming when you will not be absent from Christ anymore. When this body decays, when this body is gone, when when you die, you will be with Christ. Because that's what this text is. Our faith is in what God has promised about our future, and we believe him. We believe him even though it's just not available to your visual senses today. We believe, we faith, we have faith. We live by faith. We're going to believe him. And Paul says in verse 8, we are confident, I say, because of faith, because we live by faith, we're confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. By faith, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be with the Lord. But because of my faith, because I trust him, 
uh, I would have these preferences. I, have, I would rather have this. What, I, what would please me, I would prefer, I would be pleased with, I would delight, it would delight us. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be cool if you could just bypass all of this struggling faith, fight the fight of faith stuff, this feature of Christianity, living by faith? Wouldn't it be na- nice if you just bypass that and go straight to seeing? That's what I wish. It's not easy to live by faith. Now, I do live by faith. I trust Christ. I really believe that what Jesus did on the cross took away all of my sins. If it didn't, I'm going to hell. But no, he died for all of my sins. I believe him. But that's not easy. I would love to bypass that and go straight to where I can see him. That's where I want to go. I want to go right there where I can see him. And Paul says, we're confident of this. We're confident. We have a firm assurance that this will happen. Now, I want to chase a rabbit today uh, and do some theology with you. Um, we know that when Jesus comes, we are going to be re- and be, we will be resurrected when He comes again into a new bodies. We're going to be changed into glorious bodies. We'll be changed into bodies that are exactly like Jesus's resurrected body. I don't exactly know what all that means, but I know that when He comes, that's what our resurrected bodies will be like. That's biblical. It's going to happen in the flash. It's going to happen in a twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen in a millisecond. And then from then on, we're going to be like that forever. Have this glorified body transformed in a millisecond to be just like Jesus' body, and it'll never change. It'll be that way forever. And from that point on, this new physical slash spiritual body that we have is... uh, formed to be with Jesus, will be with Jesus forever. That's basic doctrine of the resurrection, the resurrected body. We studied that back when we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So my question is, what is it that we will be at home with the Lord? We will be at home with the Lord Jesus when this body is destroyed, when we die. What does that mean? We're gonna be resurrected On the resurrection day, when Jesus comes again, we'll be resurrected in a new body. What about when I die? What does that mean I'm going to be with the Lord? It's not the same thing as a resurrected body. It's not the same thing as the resurrection. It's not. This is what we call in theological textbooks of the intermediate state. Now, I know there's some who object to that term, uh, but that's really, I think, the best term for it, an intermediate state. And that's best described, I think, uh, Jesus uh, talks to his disciples in John chapter 11. Uh, His buddy Lazarus was sick. Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick, and he waits on purpose. Stays there four more days, doesn't go back. And after this, Jesus said to them, to his disciples, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Yeah, sleep's good for you when you're sick. Well, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So what happened to Lazarus? He died but Jesus calls him asleep. Then he just has to tell him plainly that he died, but he's asleep. I've got to go wake him up. Where is he at? What's happening with him? Where, Where is Lazarus? What's going on with Lazarus that Jesus can go wake him up from the dead? He's falling asleep. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, it says, after that, after the resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to more than, after he appeared to the 12 apostles, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom were still living at the time of this writing, but some have fallen asleep. So you have Christians who saw Jesus alive after his resurrection have now died. That's what he means. They've fallen asleep. They've died. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
14 through 15, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. All right, these are Christians who have died, called them fallen asleep, they've died, but when Jesus comes again, he's gonna bring them with him first. So where are they at now? Where are the ones who've died at now that he's gonna bring them with him when he comes? According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. They have fallen asleep, they have died, but they're with him now. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 10, he died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we're still alive or or we've died, doesn't matter, we may live together with him. So there's this place or there's this state that Christians who've died are with Jesus. People who believed in Jesus' death on the cross for their sin, who have called on him to save them from their sins, who have trusted what he did on the cross for their salvation, when they die, they go be with him and he will bring them back when he comes. He'll bring them with him when he comes. That's the state they call intermediate state. It's not soul sleep. Some people have interpreted this as they're asleep as if when you die, you just go to sleep and you wake up at the resurrection. And then they'll say things like, oh, well, you don't remember what the night you woke up, you went to bed last night, you woke up this morning, you, you weren't aware of time lapsing by. They'll say things like that, but that's not what this is. We, it just means that we died physically. That's what a sleep means. But if being away from the body means to be at home with the Lord, then there's no such thing as a sleep zone. If you're not in this body, that means you're with the Lord. You're not in bed. You're not asleep, you're not dreaming, you're with him. And also we're not in some sort of waiting room like a purgatory. There is no such thing as purgatory. There is no such thing as a waiting room waiting to see him, to get in line, to get in there where Jesus is. No, when you die, our souls are in a state of conscious awareness that we're in the presence of Jesus with him. I guess... Soul, I don't know what that's like, non-corporeal form, kind of stuff they talk about on Star Trek. But that's all I know. That's all I know. That's all I know about anything. In fact, I think that's all anybody knows theologically. You die in Christ, you go be with him. But you're not resurrected yet. You have not received your glorified body yet. You get that when he comes again. Between now and then, you're just with him. And I do know this, that we do, those those of us who do belong to Jesus will be with the Lord and it will be a condition of ultimate bliss and happiness and joy. You're not just sitting in a room with him. You're enjoying being with him. Glory. Glory. Not the same as a resurrected body, but you with him in glory, in joy, in happiness, in bliss. Then, when the resurrection comes, you get a new, a new boy, a new, a new body. You'll get your new eternal home in the flash. Now, those who don't believe in Jesus, same thing, they die, and then their soul goes to a place of sad, gloomy, dark torment. Well, that's our theology for today. The eternal state. What happens to believers? They go to be with the Lord and they have uh, happiness and joy. Unbelievers go to a place of sad, gloomy, dark torment waiting for the final judgment. That's what's gonna happen. That's our theology. Now, Paul says he would prefer that that be the case. I would prefer to be away from this body and at home with the Lord. I would prefer that be my situation. I'm gonna go ahead and go along with Paul, me too. That's what I wish. I would much rather have that in this current state of trouble, hardship, persecution, suffering, despair, uh, uh, sin, everything wrong with me, everything wrong with this world, everything wrong with you dealing with me be better to be with Jesus right now and not have to deal with any of this anymore. 
I'm looking forward to that. Paul says too, we prefer that. He says in Philippians chapter 1, 24, 20 through 24, he says, I eagerly expect, and he's talking about a, a trial that he's going to have to go before Caesar. I eagerly expect and hope that, in, that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. So no matter what happens to me in my trial with uh, the Roman authorities, Jesus is going to be glorified in me, whether they kill me or whether I'm alive. I'm not going to be ashamed and I'm going to bring glory to Jesus. Then he says, and even if I die, big deal. For me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't remember the last time I thought something like that. Oh, wouldn't it be great to die? I can't wait until I die. That's gonna be gain. Yay. What about that? Paul said it, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I die, it's better. And he even says it right here, verse 22, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I'm torn. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. There should should never be a single anxiety and worry for a Christian about dying. No, I get it. I do. I know you do too. I don't want to die. I don't want to die today. But even if I did, that'd be great. That's better by far than what I have now. And I've got it made now. Actually, I don't. I do. Except y'all are here. <laughs> Paul said, it's more necessary that I remain with you than I remain in the body for now, which is exactly the same thing he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I would rather die, which is better by far. I would rather be away from the body and in pres- present with the Lord, in, not away from the Lord, in his presence with him. And then he says it in verse, verse 9, so we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it. It's more necessary that I remain from you. And since it's necessary that I remain with you, uh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. It's, It's right now better for me to stay here and minister to you. That's why he says, so we make it our goal to please him. We live while we wait, while we're waiting on Jesus to come back, while we're waiting on our body to finally die and we can go be with him. We make it our goal. We live our lives to please him. To make it our goal means to consider it an honor. It's a privilege. It's a, it means to love honor, to enjoy honor. I, it would be honor to me. I would, it would please me greatly. I would love it. I make it my goal to please him, to live, to please him in every way even. By the way we live, I want my life to be acceptable to him. I want my life to be pleasing to him. We do the things that are Christian. We do and we live a Christian life from the heart. That's what pleasing him is. We plug in to please him. Paul says, this will mean fruitful labor for me. We we plug in to please him by doing the good works that he created for us to do. You're a Christian, you do good works. You're a Christian, you believe Jesus, you believe Jesus died for you and you have called on him to save you from your sins, then you do good works. He says in Ephesians 2, 10, he commanded us this, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. We please him in every way, we make it our goal to please him, we do that by doing good works. Colossians 1.10, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Now, I'm not gonna harp on every one of these. I just got a few things I wanna say. You find something that needs to be done and you do it. You serve. We please him by serving God's people. And in the context 
of the church. God's people are here at the church. You find somebody who has a need, you find a need that needs to be done, and you plug in and you do it. You use your spiritual gift to serve and build up the body. The Holy Spirit gave us each a gift to plug it in and build up the body and strengthen each other with a spiritual gift. You do that stuff. 1 Peter 4.10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. 1 Corinthians 12.7, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit, that's the gift, is given for the common good. You come and you do your gift for the common good of the people at the church. That's pleasing the Lord. You make that your goal, to please him by using your gift to serve. I think it's pretty much anything you can think of that would meet a need that somebody has, you do it. You let that be your mindset. When Paul says, we make it our goal to please him. It is my privilege, my joy, my honor. I consider it an honor that I can please him by plugging in whatever spiritual gift I have to use it to bless you to find whatever need is out there and do it. That's pleasing the Lord. I think it's uh, also we would give of our financial resources. Someday, hopefully not too far from now, we'll get to this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. That's only three more chapters from now. You know I get to preach a bunch of sermons on giving. Y'all can bring your checkbooks to church that day. He says, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. You give your financial resources to supply the needs of the ministry of the church. That's pleasing to the Lord. That's pleasing to him. We make it our goal to please him, do it with your checkbook. Here's a good one. Uh, We speak of Christ. We speak of his death on the cross. We speak of his resurrection from the grave. We evangelize the lost. You want to know a good way to please Christ? You want to know a good way to please him? You want to make it your goal to please Christ? Tell somebody else about him. I heard an illustration. This was in seminary. Paige Patterson said, if I rescued you out of a fire, what would I wish you would do? You get on your knees and grovel at my feet and say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or you, you would, which would give me more glory? You do that or you go tell everybody what I did for you. What do you think is going to please me more? Go tell everybody what I did. Go tell everybody what Jesus did for you to save you and what he did for them to save them. That's evangelism. That's pleasing to the Lord. Jesus said, go make disciples, Matthew 28. Go make disciples, go and make disciples of all the nations. Now, I just made, tried to, sort of made it a put down, but I don't mean to make it put down. We please the Lord. We make it our goal to please the Lord, and we do that by worshiping him. We worship him in spirit and truth. We worship him. We come to him with our hearts, with our minds, with our souls, every part of our being, and we praise him and we worship him. True worship. Jesus told the Samaritan woman in John 4, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. That's pleasing to the Lord. That's pleasing to the Lord when you praise him. Here's another one. You want to be pleasing to the Lord, we pray. You don't think of that one as a a way to praise the Lord. I mean, the way to please the Lord is it No, we pray. Christians, people who belong to Jesus, people who have the Holy Spirit in them, pray. And we pray to him about everything. Everything. We seek his will. We cry out to him for grace. We we cry out to him and call on him for mercy. We call on him about everything. We have a prayer list a mile long and we say every, every single one of those to him. That's pleasing to him. Anything that touches our lives, we have to pray about it. That's our goal. Our goal is to please the Lord, and part of that pleasing the Lord is just praying to him, asking him, calling on him. 
Paul writes to the Ephesians chapter 6, 18, I pray in the Spirit on all occasions. It means every time you pray. With all kinds of prayers and requests, that means about everything. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Just pray. That's pleasing to the Lord. We make it our goal to please the Lord. I've already forgot my list. Serve, plug in, do fruitful label, do works, use your gifts, give your financial resources, evangelize, worship, pray. Here's a good one. Be sanctified. Live your life in such a way that's growing in holiness. Live your life in a way that's increasing in godliness, increasing in moral purity, increasing in righteous behavior, and decreasing in frequency of sinful desires and evil things. Pleasing the Lord means your life is changing to be more like Christ in righteousness. You do this when you're with people, and you do this when you're by yourself. You live your life in growing righteousness to Christ. Sanctification. Paul said to Colossians 3, 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 14, as obedient children, do not conform to evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So you want to please the Lord in every way? You want to make it your goal to please the Lord? Then be holy. While you wait for this reunion to be in the presence of Jesus, physically, visually, not like it is now. Now, and I, I know there's a lot of stuff I'm skipping. I'm missing a lot of things. In fact, you could go on and on. How many ways you can please the Lord? How many ways would, make your, would you make it your goal to please the Lord? Lots of them. I only gave you seven. But this is critical and this is important in our Christian faith and our practice. We do live by faith. We live by faith. Nobody here has any works that are worth a flip. You can't do anything to make God please be pleased with you with your own flesh. You have nothing good to give him that would make him happy with you. But you make it your goal to please him. But none of that counts in the flesh. And we do believe God is going to bring us to this visible presence of Jesus. We're going to see him. And we're going to, he's going to do that for us by his grace only. Anyone's ever saved only by God's grace. You can't do anything to earn it. You don't deserve it. He's going to give it to you anyway through faith in his son. That's the only way anybody's saved. Ever. Ever. Faith in Jesus Christ. Ever. But by his grace, we also live our lives to please him in every way. And that matters. That really matters. He says in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him in the things for the things done in the body, for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now we studied this also, this is a little bit more theology. We studied this back in 1 Corinthians also. Believers are not condemned for their sins. Jesus saves us from all of our sins. We do not stand before God with any sin that's not covered up. Every sin has been covered by his blood. We will not be condemned at all one bit for anything we've ever done through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no condemnation. Our sins will never be held against us. But our works, the things we do in the body, whether good or bad, our works, the things that we even say to ourselves, this is my goal to please him. My goal is to please the Lord. So I make it my goal. I make it my honor. I make it my practice, my privilege, my joy to please him. Even those things that I do to please him, they will be judged. Jesus is going to judge all of those. 
He's going to, all those things will be judged by Christ. This is a, the Greek word, this is the, called the bema. You ever heard that before? Bema seat. This is the bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. It means a court. We stand before him in court. Let me try to explain this the best I can. We will stand before Christ, not for our sins, but for our works. And he's going to judge our works. He's going to judge them fairly, and he's going to judge them righteously. All of the things you do in the body, your works that, are, that you meant to be pleasing to him, he's going to judge them. And he will give his praises then. He will give what is due. Matthew 25, Jesus said to the master who did all the stuff that he left him in charge to do, verse 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. He left this this servant in charge of something. He did what he was left in charge to do. And when the master got back, he said, well done. That's praise. You did what I left you to do. You did what I told you to do. Well done. Come and enter your share, your master's happiness. Let's have a party. Let's enjoy this, this, uh, this glory together. Here's a praise. That's what that means. He judged his, his, judged his works to be good and faithful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 through 5, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. I think I'm doing the right thing. I believe I'm doing the right thing. I'm not feeling guilty or stressed out about my thing, the things I've done in the body, but that doesn't make me innocent. I still got to deal with Jesus judging me. He says it. That does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. That means each will receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Same thing means the same thing. He will expose the motives of men's hearts. Everything's going to be exposed Everything's going to be exposed at the Bema seat. Everything is going to be exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. He is going to test everyone's work. He's going to test. I've got it down. At least I taught it this way when we were in 1 Corinthians. Three, these are three characteristics about our work. The quality of our work, the, how long our work lasts, and what the motivation we had when we did our work. And we will receive rewards from Christ or we will lose rewards from Christ depending on those criteria. And I believe this is what Paul means in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's the same, I think he's talking about the same thing. In fact, I know he's talking about the same thing. Chapter 3, verse 10 through 15. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on that. Now building means you're working. You're doing what pleases to the Lord, what pleases the Lord. You're actually working to please the Lord. You're building on this foundation that Paul built. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than what the one already has been has already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, if any man works on this, Using, and Paul gives these metaphors, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. His work will be shown for what it is because the day, that's the day Jesus comes, resurrection day, the day will bring it to light. That's what he says in chapter four. He will bring it to light and expose the motives of men's heart. He'll bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Now here's your metaphor, Wood, hay, and straw, how will that hold up under fire? Not very good. Gold, silver, and costly stones, how will they hold up? They're going to last. If what he has built survives, he will receive 
his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. That's the Bema seat. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is going to judge our works. We have it as our goal to please him in every way. We're to do works. We're to use our gifts. We're to give our resources. We're to evangelize. We're to worship. All of those things we do, but God's going to judge those things. How we did them, the quality of them, the the long-lasting, the endurance of them, and the motive that we had when we did it. Did you go do something when you worked for the Lord and you you were pleasing to him, but the whole time you were going, I wish I didn't have to do this. Anybody ever done that? I guarantee you, I've preached sermons like that. I would have rather stayed home. You know what? That's got burned up. That's a piece of wood thrown into the fire. Best sermon I ever preached. Not this one. I'm not not saying that about this one. This is not the best one I ever preached either. But that one was, God's going to judge our works. What you do to serve the Lord, what you do to please him in every way will be judged by him. And it matters how you do it. It matters how you live while you're groaning in this world, while you're groaning in this body. It matters how you live your life while you're longing for him to come back. It matters how you live your life while you're longing to be with him and away from this body. It matters how you live now. It matters what you do now. He's going to judge it. So here we are for now, away from the Lord, and we will be with him visibly when we die. We will be resurrected when he comes. Surely we prefer that. I do. I mean that. I mean it. I prefer that. That's what I want. I want that to happen. But it has an effect on our lives. That should change our lives. That truth right there will change your life, how you serve him now. We want to honor him by how we live and by our works now so that when he comes to judge them, he'll be, he'll be pleased with our works and reward us for our works. It's not just a token, pat you on the back and say, well done, good and faithful servant. No, you really want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That was a great thing you did. That was a great sermon and you had a great attitude the whole time you started studying until you got ready to let it all hang out. Good work. Or whatever it is you did, you changed the light bulbs. Good work. That's, 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 that's gonna be a good day. That's gonna happen because we're going to be with him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given us this text today that we could study um, about knowing that we're gonna be with you away from this body in the presence of Jesus. Lord, we do indeed long for that day. We do indeed groan until that day happens. And Lord, we know that's gonna be a better day than what we have now. Father, I do thank you that you have motivated us today to serve you and to do works that are pleasing to you, to do the things that you've required for us, the things you've left us, the things that need to be done that you've called us to do. Uh, make those things happen with us. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the not just the need before us and the desire to do it, but the desire to do it well, the desire to do it so that it lasts a long time, and the desire to do it so that Everybody will be blessed by the work we do, by pleasing you. And Lord, we're just going to leave that to you, how to judge that because you always do what's right and you always do what's fair. But Lord, we do want you to bless us. Uh, Just give us opportunities, open our eyes to let us see what we're supposed to do and to do it. I pray these things for Jesus' sake and in his name. For his glory, amen.